Okay, hi guys. Anyway, um, I've had some requests. People seem to like some of my chats and reminiscence about working for Balanchine and Robbins and the good old days of the New York City Ballet. But before I uh, go into a little of that, um, the, a friend of mine in New York who's um, kind of high up in the New York City Ballet world, uh, she, she had some things to say, uh, criticisms of me from that area based on all these chats that I've been doing, you know, which, uh, you know, they're off the cuff and uh, I thought I could bring something to the table, but I actually wrote down what she said the gossip was back east, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, number one, I'm too focused on the past. Uh, I'm sure it comes out, off like that, that I'm too, you know, going down memory lane too much and I'm not looking at the future, etc. But I believe in the past. I believe that if you don't learn from the past, you repeat it, as the old saying goes. But also that by looking at what past dancers did and past choreographers, uh, it sets a bar for us. And sometimes uh, when you're so busy doing it yourself and you're you know, dancing or you're choreographing, you're focused on your own work, um, you forget what went before. And there's a thing called hubris. And um, that's uh, basically a Greek word about a cloud surrounding a person so you can't see outside the cloud, you only see your own reflection in the cloud as it were. So I like to uh, remind myself and also other dancers of what was accomplished in the past because then you can tell if what you're doing is really good or new or if it's been done before, if it's been done better before, which happens, it happens to the best of us. I know I thought I came up with some new things until I looked at some old balancing things or even not balancing and I went oh my god you know that's been done and done better so it's kind of I like to remind myself of the past and I think there's nothing wrong with that I mean if I come out uh, come off sounding too nostalgic well excuse me but um, I think it's a learning tool um, it's something to uh, strive towards in my opinion. Um, then of course the criticism that I'm way too um, focused on balancing. Well, it's hard not to be because when you work with a genius like that, it kind of can affect your whole life. And since, as you know, if you've been watching these, I had a rather different relationship with him than just a dancer or a student or anything like that. Um, I won't go into it again. It's in my book. I have to remember I can't talk about what's in my book. but. Um, Again, as I've said, I think that the New York City Ballet, Balanchine founded the company with Robbins, but it was Balanchine's company, and Balanchine is synonymous with American style of ballet. Uh, I think it's an advantage for the New York City Ballet to maintain its supremacy as a Balanchine company, but you can't do that if it's not passed down hand-to-hand -hand from someone that worked with Balanchine um, intimately like I did. So, and there are not that many of us left, I'm not the only one, but there's not very many left, so I thought it would be a positive to bring this to the young generation of uh, the New York City Ballet. I didn't mean to criticize them. And that brings me to number three, which is that a lot of dancers, or the feeling is from some dancers, I'm too critical of the current New York City Ballet, uh, the dancers, etc. Uh, you know, it's, I'm trying to be, I'm critical but with love, because I think that if the dancers, the current dancers, which are talented, I mean, there's no doubt, but if the current dancers were just lit better, costumed better, um, really understood what the choreography was they were doing of Balanchine, um, it would just enhance them. It would not not take anything away from them. It would just make them even more glorious. And again, this is only about Balanchine because certainly with Justin Peck and the, the new choreographers they have that are doing very well by them, um, they have all that. But going back to my point that I think Balanchine should be still very well represented at the company, um, maybe that's how I, I come off too critical of the dancers. But I'm not. I'm really not. I just think they'd be even better. Anyway, then the other thing which I was waiting for is that I'm too old, that I've, you know, I've passed my peak, and etc., which is why I want to do these in person, you know, to show you I'm not dead. And also that why I post some things of me dancing like I did this morning when I was getting ready for class. Um, 
it's a very American thing, actually, it's too old. But um, what I had told members of the board and what I was you know, trying to say from the very beginning when I threw my hat in the ring is that I'm conscious of this and that I wanted to bring um, a girl with me, a ballerina in the company that's there now, or actually had mentioned Wendy Whalen, because I know she's a front runner, um, to uh, be my assistant director, deputy director, whatever, and try to give them all the information I had from working with Balanchine and Robbins and all the experience I've gleaned from staging the ballets all over the world and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, um, to give my second in command, as it were, everything I knew so that uh, when my time was up, which could be a few years, could be 10 years, who knows, but when uh, my time is over, that this person would be the natural one to then take over the reins and there wouldn't be any kind of a big disaster search or, you know, this person that I could teach everything to I know, you know, because I think that's the best way to maintain the legacy of Balanchine and the legacy of the New York City Ballet. So that's the, the, my answers to my critics. Um, that's that. Now, <laughs> just a little chat about Balanchine. Um, as I, I'm probably repeating myself, but he did his piano reductions from the orchestra score. He walked into the studio so well prepared. Uh, his knowledge of the classical vocabulary was better than anybody's in the world. You know his background, so don't have to repeat that. He um, knew his dancers from teaching class every day, which I think is a must if you're a choreographer. And he was very open-minded um, about new music, about new movement. He invited Merce Cunningham to do a ballet for the company. He collaborated on a ballet with Martha Graham. He championed Jerome Robbins from the very beginning and always put up with Jerry's Jerryisms, Robinsisms, you know what I mean. So, um, and there was always a sense of joy with Balanchine when he came into the room for class or um, rehearsals. And as I said earlier, you know, he would, if he was going to choreograph a new ballet, he would actually go up to whoever he wanted as the uh, lead dancers, and he would <laughs> say, "You know, dear, I start ballet tomorrow. You know, we do a new ballet. Uh, I, would you like to be in it? Would you like to do? I think maybe, be, maybe if you'd like to do." It always amazed me when he did this, and he did it to everybody, um, even Suzanne Farrell, you know, I mean, he would say, Susie, I'm doing New Ballet, would you like to be in it? Like, anybody's going to say no. <laughs> but it was that kind of respect for the dancers that um, made us all love him so much and was so charming. Of course he knew we were going to do his ballet, <laughs> but it was the respect um, and almost the childlike approach he took that, that, you know, now there were some dancers in the company that fought him tooth and nail, that I'll say for my book, and you're going to be surprised at who they were. And there's still current dancers or ex-dancers that are running around New York City right now, and teachers, but mostly dancers, that go on and on about how much they learned from Balanchine and, you know, what a great influence he was on their career, etc., etc., who never took his class, and if they did, they pouted. And um, he only started using these dancers in solo roles really near the end of his life, so I don't really count they knew anything, quite frankly. But because they danced for Balanchine, you know, they now are free to say whatever they want to say, except <laughs> I was an eyewitness, which they don't like. So they know that when they see me, I see through them. And that I think is a problem because some of these people still have a say in New York not New York City Ballet, but they have a say. So, you know, I have a mixed reputation. I don't put up with BS very well. I didn't put up with BS from Zakharova. I didn't put up with BS from Lopotkina at the Mariansky when I staged Balanchine Ballets. Um, I'm not a hard ass, but uh, I'm firm. So that's something people find out they because I'm so lighthearted all the time, people are a little surprised when I know what I want and I insist on that. So. Um, and I don't know if I would go over with the New York City Ballet now. For many, many years, it's been a much more lax attitude, clearly, in class. Um, we weren't allowed, Balanchine did not allow us to wear what he used to call crap in class, you know, leg warmers and this and that and sloppy attire. He said we must always dress neatly 
But you see, that, that was good because it kind of got us going all the time that we represented a higher goal. The New York City Valley was a much higher goal than just our daily lives, etc. So basically, that's about it. Um, again, I don't want to give everything away that's in my book. But he came into rehearsal totally prepared. He didn't experiment on the dancers. It's not like he would say, oh, here, you know, try this step. He pretty much just improvised dancing himself and we copied him. And then if mistakes happened and he liked that, if somebody tripped or something, you know, the, all the stories about Serenade. So he was very spontaneous. He wasn't um, like Jerry who came in with all the steps basically in his brain and we had to try to adapt to them. Now, I'm not saying Jerry didn't choreograph for us and you know, make it individual for the dancers. He did, but it wasn't as, as all the same as Balanchine. And um, it's basically because he knew us so well. He really knew what we could do and what we could look best in. Not to say he didn't stretch us and push us. Um, famous story about Mimi Paul, uh, who was the original in Vols Fantasy with me. And Mimi was not known as a big jumper originally. And uh, so Balanchine gave her all jumps <laughs> in Vols Fantasy. I mean, huge jumps all around the stage. And she did it. She was great, magnificent. But then there was another one um, that he took in as a guest artist, which he would do occasionally, um, Guylaine Tasmar, who was a big étoile at the Paris Opera. Beautiful, beautiful girl, beautiful dancer. Not as fast, you know, or as crisp as, as the Balanchine typical dancer, but she was beautiful, and Jerry Robbins liked her a lot too, and so Balanchine in class, he would say, now I'm gonna teach you how to move that ass. <laughs> and she'd be, oh mon dieu, you know. And he would just uh, push her, literally take her by the hand and pull her around, and you know, she did a few ballets for Balanchine, and he was very charming with her, but he, he got her to work. Same thing with uh, Natasha Makarova, and this is something that most people don't know. She wanted to join the New York City Ballet right after she defected. And she came into class, beautiful legs and feet, you know, just perfect proportions, beautiful training, you know, just really a great dancer, Makarova, we all know that. So she comes into class, and all the other girls froze. And I don't blame them. <laughs> I mean, they all just looked at her going, oh, God, our career is over. And she did beautifully at the bar. You know, very articulate and beautiful extensions, beautiful line. And she and Balanchine were speaking Russian all the time. And you could see he was very charmed with her. You could see that he liked her a lot. Well, we get to the center, and she's not a very good turner. And um, she realized in Balanchine's class the way he gave pirouettes was different than she'd ever had before. There was no real preparation. And if there was, it was from a deep lunge, fourth position, and there was not a time to do a big setup before you did the pirouette. The pirouette had to be organic in Balanchine's choreography. It had to come out of the dancing. Again, as I've said, Balanchine was all about the dancing, not about the steps and not about the perfect positions. It was about the movement quality. So McCarver kind of started faltering in a pirouette combination. And she didn't bring her arms in fast enough. She couldn't spot fast enough. So Balanchine would go over and he literally slapped her hard on her left arm to get it in fast enough so she could get the feeling of the turn, not just the position. And I'll never forget, he really slapped her hard, uh, her arm. Not in a mean way, but just to get her to understand. And then she also did like three or four pirouettes at the speed of light and she was shocked and her eyes got wide and she was, you know, spasiba, spasiba thank you in Russian, but um, he was a very hands-on teacher. He would pick the girls up, he would push them around, he would slap them on the butt, um, which I guess you can't do today, but he, um, but he always was very charming about it, and he told tons of jokes, tons of jokes in class, stopping the bar for 10 minutes to tell a long joke. <laughs> I asked him why, I think I may have said this earlier, I asked him, why do you do that? And he said, you know, dear, because next step will be very difficult. So I want them to relax, so I tell joke, and joke is long, so then they start thinking, when is he going to shut up, because we need to do next, next step before we get cold. I think I told that story before, but it's worth repeating, I think. So he was very smart about the way he taught. And with the choreography, he was so fast that if he got enough done for an hour or two hour rehearsal, he would let us go early. Unheard of. Most choreographers would go over and over and over and try to perfect it and get it done, you know, and it just it drives you crazy. Every choreographer, I've been with except Balanchine was like that, but not with Balanchine. If he felt that he'd gotten accomplished what he needed for that day, 
He could let you go an hour early, two hours early. And he'd say, let's go over and have a little hooker. Let's go to O'Neill's and have a little whiskey and beer, chase her. Very happy atmosphere. So that's my little today's reminiscence about Balanchine. I hope I cleared up a couple things. Um, the criticisms of me, the four that I uh, remember. I really do love the company, you know, and I, and I think the dancers are magnificent. I just think everybody can be better. We all can be better. Nobody's perfect. And I have a lot of information. I have a lot of information I'd like to give them. And um, maybe someday I will. Who knows? So that's the story for today. Happy Thursday, everyone. Oh, I'm going to finish this with a little bit of one of my classical ballets. I'm a classical choreographer. I like Tchaikovsky. I like things that are pretty. <laughs> I don't, I'm not a fan of overly acrobatic um, gymnastic ballets, unless somehow they fit the music perfectly. Uh, so I like to stick with classical music. I like to stick with the classical vocabulary. So anyway, so here's the uh, second movement of the, my Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto Number no. 1, danced by Lisa Sundstrom and Robert Underwood, who were two dancers from American Ballet Theater. And this was for jean pierre Bonfou's uh, Chautauqua Festival Ballet, oh, like 20 years ago or something. Um, but people seem to like it, so I'm adding that to the end of this. So you can see some of my choreography, which is, you know, Balanchine-esque. Sometimes, not always. Okay, bye. <laughs>